With Free Radical no more, with time splitters on ice, and with people like David Doak and Co either out of the industry or elsewhere in it, a lot of you might be wondering, what else is there to talk about? So that I say, plenty. Allow me to document the remaining history of Free Radical and Time Splitters, the 10 years after the demise of Free Radical and what has been happening. There's a lot to say here, a lot which will surprise you. So sit back as the final part of the long saga of Free Radical and Time Splitters ends here. Let's go. As I mentioned in the intro, a lot of you are probably wondering what is even left to discuss here. Free Radical is gone, David Duck is out of the industry, many of the other founders are elsewhere, or are freelance, or in different companies, and even if the workers of the now defunct company are elsewhere. But there's still a lot to say, believe it or not. In terms of the reaction to the death of Free Radical, it's hard to give an overall consensus as to how people felt about it but disappointment and upset is very evident. Digging around, I did discover a page, a forum one it seems, that expresses everything. Sadness that Free Radical is no longer around, no more time splitters, hope that it was just false reporting, so on. It's hard to gauge an overall fan reaction to the news, but judging from comments as recent as 2019, when this video was made, and comments from back in... 2008, it was met with disappointment and sadness. Moving back to Free Radical, or what remains of it should I say, the company will be bought around early 2009 by a company called Crytek. Crytek is a company founded by Free Brothers, forgive me for saying the names wrong, Sevat Yerli, Anvi Yerli and Farouk Yerli in September of 1999. To anyone familiar with them, you'll know that they are the masterminds behind the, behind the Far Cry series. It would be in 2009 that they would acquire the broken remains of Free Radical, renaming it to the Crytek UK. With Timesplitters seemingly stuck in limbo and the fate of Timesplitters 4 unknown, fans would be curious as to the fate of the series something that had been seen by Crytek UK, and one that they wanted to address. Speaking of the series in an article published around August of 2009, Hilton implied that such a game would be made if there was an industry demand for it. However, it will be three years later, in 2012, in which a series of events would reinvigorate a community, one which would take the game in media by storm. The Time Splitters fandom has an interesting history with fan games. There have been quite a few of them actually. An Anaconda remake on Newgrounds, Time Splitters Gold, Time Splitters Mayhem, so on and so forth. The Time Splitters community has some level of familiarity with fan games, but little did the community and game press know that in 2012, things would take a surprising turn for the series. While rumours upon rumours of Time Splitters 4 being worked on by Crytek had circulated since the acquisition, nothing definitive had ever come of it, and the community would go primarily silent until 2012, where things would change. In 2012, a petition would be created by an individual named Daniel Wesley, and the ambition of the petition in question was lofty. 400,000 people strong for a new Time Splitters game. 400,000 people strong for Time Splitters 4. The petition had been in response to a comment by Crytek CEO, Sevat Yearly, on the topic of the series, quote, I wish we were working on it, I will say that. I think hope are high, but change has to happen in the platform space. I'm very excited potentially about the idea of a Time Splitters for G Face. The thing with Time Splitters is, if we made a sequel to Time Splitters, nobody would accept this apart from some fans, and we don't know how big the fan community is, unfortunately and we don't want to design this as a packaged goods game that launches on a console, and even if we wanted to, I don't think publishers would like the idea. That's the truth. And that was the truth, even before we bought Free Radical." End quote. These words from Yearly would instigate Wesley to begin the petition, and as a result, the petition would gain the attention of the game in press and media. 
While it's unknown when exactly in 2012 he created it, judging by the articles reporting on it at the time, and around the same time as Yearly commenting on the series, it can be inferred that the petition was started in June of 2012, around the 12th to the 18th. Both a Change.org page and a Facebook page had been created, so it could rally together fans and show Yearly and Crydeck how much demand there was for a fourth Time Splitters game. Personally, I actually remember the hype for the campaign at the time. I was one of the people who would sign the petition over on Change.org. Like many, I had high hopes for these efforts. With the fan campaign in action, gaming media would take the interview in Wesley, to which he responded with his goals and motives for the campaign. Quote, in all honesty, I've been trying to get the word out about Time Splitters for, for three years now with the guys over at Time Splitters Portal. We were always getting our hopes built up with possible announcements for new Time Splitters, but it always fell through or never showed. I remember a few months ago, a site showed up saying they had seen Time Splitters 4 in action, and that was set for an E3 reveal this year, but obviously if you had followed E3, it was a no-show. It was getting tiring. I would constantly speak to people about spreading the word, but it'd only get a few feet off the ground before tumbling down. The thing is, the Time Splitters community is scattered. They are hiding in holes, trying to escape today's generic military crap. Our campaign is trying to dig them out of the holes and tell them it's okay. We are your freedom fighters." End quote. It would be in the same interview that Wesley revealed his attempted connections to Crytek and some of the former Free Radical staff's enthusiasm for the campaign. Quote, I have been speaking with various Crytek people for over a year now. At the beginning of the campaign, Crytek members were the ones who boosted the numbers quite high. Graham Norgate, the composer of the Time Splitters soundtrack, even said that if the group reaches 100,000, then he'll write a Time Splitters styled victory piece. A senior artist at Crytek also said he would design a Time Splitters character if the campaign reached 1,000, which was passed a while back, but obviously these things have to take time. And we also have the person behind Like a Monkey for Time Splitters Future Perfect that is going to do a remix if it reaches 10,000. That we have already passed, but remember these people are busy, and we'll have to wait patiently. End quote. While it's unknown whether Norget or any, or any of the other Free Radical employees ever held to their promises in the campaign, regardless, the campaign will continue to generate traction, creating another petition in the process. This one made around the end of 2012 and demanding a HD collection of the three Time Splits games. To which Crytek actually said they would make if the petition got to 300,000 signatures. Overall, for the first time in years, the Time Splits community had hope. Something that had waned in the aftermath of the death of Free Radical. But unbeknownst to most of the fans in the signing of the petition, or Crytek for that matter, Daniel Wesley had been working on something big. Something that would bring hope to a fan base. Sometime in 2012, with May being the earliest indication of the project's existence, at least online, Daniel Wesley would begin to create a Time Splitters themed mod for Unreal Tournament 2004. The idea was simple, to get the maps and characters from the Time Splitters game into that of Unreal, creating a mod that would ultimately satisfy Time Splitters fans' need for a new game. And progress on this mod was good. From the footage that had been released, it looked very high quality and there was a lot of potential of it. Progress on the mod would continue for quite some time. However, progress on the mod and being released would suddenly cease, as at one point, Crytek had sent a cease and desist out to the project. With no longer being legally able to release the project, Wesley would discontinue it publicly, although according to some sources, it's said that he continued to work on it for his own use. However, despite the bad news, a major advancement had come to pass. Crytek UK would officially allow fans to make a Time Splitters mod using their engine, CryEngine. While the petitions had not gotten Time Splitters 4, while the petitions had not gotten the HD collection or the Unreal mod, it had given fans a way to fully realise and create a game that would be worthy of the Time Splitters name. Upon the release of the news, the Time Splitters community was significantly reinvigorated with hope, excitement being a common feeling seen throughout most reactions, and the Facebook page originally meant for the Unreal mod, uh, 100,000 strong for Time Splitters 4 campaign, would become the page for the new project. The decision to be so open with fans and allow them to create the game was also subject to significant attention from the game and press. 
most of it being praised for not rough handling fans like say a company like Nintendo would when it comes to fan projects of their games. By December of that year, a team had been assembled and progress had begun on the mod, officially allowed by Crytek. Although an odd detail of this was that the creation of the mod was never officially written down in contract form, it was never a written agreement, to which sources I have asked claimed may have been a move by Crytek to ensure they could cancel the project at any given time, without any binding legal documents, although it's unknown how true this is. Regardless of this incredibly odd detail, fan hopes were high and the team would get harder work on creating the official mod, although the Facebook page would still retain a strong emphasis on the 100,000 strong for Timesplitters 4 petition. While the team working on the official mod would go silent for some time, members of the team would eventually speak out in a February 2013 interview, although what they had to say was ultimately minimal. Quote, Crytek gave Daniel and the team he put together permission to use the official Timesplitters assets and are backing his endeavour. At this moment in time, the project is shrouded in secrecy. We are hoping he comes forward and releases a video for what they have achieved soon. End quote. Regardless of the little amount of information provided, the team would work earnestly on the project. And the project would be given its official name on March 3rd, 2013. Time Splitters Rewind. Continuing on, it would be in August of 2013 that some of the first alpha gameplay of the project would be shown to the public, would surface, while the links to the videos are now long since dead, and I haven't been able to find any kind of backup anywhere, it can be presumed that it was the gameplay, or somewhat similar to the gameplay, that one of the members had shown off around this time of Ice Station. From looking at what remains of this video, progress was relatively minimal and according to sources called the Re Rewind Team, this version of the ice station map that had been featured in the video was actually a direct rip. D despite this, hopes were high for the project, and it would be in around this time in which a particular name would come to be associated with the project, Michael Hubica. More on this later news would come to fans and followers of the Rewind project, as the game was announced to be in development for the PlayStation 4 on September 3rd, 2013, and the game would also be put up on Steam later on September 9th, 2013, via Steam Greenlight. The page no longer exists, but from what can be gathered from it, it showcased basic information on the project and the name of the team behind it, Pantheonix. The Facebook page would continue to provide fans with new details, with one such post on the 13th of September 2013 talking about the possibility of post-game monetization, what platforms the game would be on, and so on and so forth. With high hopes for the project, the Rewind development team would begin to create additional spaces for followers and fans of the project, one such space being the Timesplitters Rewind site, which would launch around December of 2013 and continue to be worked on up until the beginning of the new year. A demo of Rewind in pre-alpha was originally planned for release around this time, although this never came to fruition. However, it would be in 2014 to 2015 in which things would begin to change massively, although it's debatable if these were good changes. Please note, some of this information is public, while other pieces of information were actually sent to me by an anonymous source during the development of this video. I can't confirm everything about this information, but it does paint somewhat of a clear picture of development. Q 
keep this in mind, take information with a grain of salt. It might not entirely be true. The creator behind the campaign to get 100,000 signatures for Time Splitters 4, and the man behind Rewind, Daniel Wesley, would begin to have a lesser role in the project, leaving the game's production in the hands of Michael Huberker in March of 2014. Although it never seems to have been fully confirmed, Wesley would ultimately leave active production of Rewind having never returned to full production, although the reason he had left was reportedly because he was in the process of getting married, thus he would not have been able to keep full control of the project any longer due to getting married, as said before. According to Hubica, Wesley had met him on Reddit, and Hubica had come onto the team as a community manager, although it's unknown when such a conversation transpired. Thus, with prior this prior relationship, Wesley felt it was right to hand over the reins of the project to Hubica. Around this point in Rewind's life, issues and frustration had begun to arise. The first issue would be that certain people developing the game, who I will not mention uh, in terms of their names, were not supposed to be doing this project to begin with. Many of the people on the team already had contract signed jobs and were working on the project, they very much risked the possibility of losing their contract jobs. You see, our programmers were really good. They were really good. They knew what they were talking about. They were really fun guys as well. Talking to them was, was a pleasure. But they had jobs. As I said, they had jobs which forbid them from doing this, so they had to do it in secret. That must have meant that they really, really wanted to work on this, and they really, really must have loved time splitters. Handling their time between both would prove to be difficult. One person in particular on the Rewind team would come to be a contentious point in many of the team's actions. The aforementioned Michael Hubica. An excitable person, Hubica had come to be the face of the project since Wesley's absence, participating in interviews by the gaming media, although this would prove to be a contentious move, as according to some of the other Rewind staff members, he participated in interviews a bit too much, promising things that the team would not be able to keep their word to, such as the game being on a particular system and so forth. Hubica? who I think really enjoyed that aspect because he loved giving interviews, probably a bit too much actually, considering he said some things which unfortunately we can't really keep to the promises that were made back then. I know that one of the big things that people were throwing about was Time Splitters Rewind on PS4 and Time Splitters Rewind on this and so on and so forth. I think there was even a news article about how Time Splitters Rewind was going to be on the Wii U. So, you know, there's there was a lot of really dodgy stuff being said around the time. Despite this, he would prove to be the catalyst for decisions within the team that would help to a degree. One such decision being the decision to switch engines. CryEngine had become difficult to work with. With every bit of work the team would do, it would ultimately be undermined by constant engine changes by Crytek that would break and make the work previously done unusable because it was not up to date with the latest version of the engine. This issue had become frustrating enough to the point in which programmers left, leaving the team with only artists. But all I do know is that we had working multiplayer, and one day we didn't have working multiplayer. We had a working weapon system, one day it stopped working. One day we had a stable game, and one day the game just kept crashing. And this was causing headaches for our programmers, and they left. They left the project purely because it didn't seem worth it. It didn't seem worth constantly rebuilding what they had made over and over and over again to to just have it break again, so they left. As a result, the team would speak about such issues with their Crytek source, Hasid Zala. Zala had been a programmer of the original Time Splitters games and was, according to my anonymous source, the man who had given the green light for Rewind to exist in the first place. Zala granted them permission to work in an Unreal Engine due to how easier it was. Interestingly, many of Rewind's members and Zala had been in touch, with Zala apparently in the process of securing the Time Splitters IP from Crytek and into the hands of Dan Buster Studios, although this attempt was apparently unlikely and unsuccessful, as Crytek would keep control of the Time Splitters IP. Over the course of 2014, Crytek had undergone several structural changes, one of which being the selling of Crytek UK, reforming as Dambuster Studios. More on Dambuster later. 
Either due to the struggles with development or otherwise, a desire the team on Rewind had at the time was to make the project seem more like a collaborated fan effort. The result was a proposed plan for the community to make assets that would aid in development and involve the community they had built up around the game more into the development, although this plan never came to fruition. The decision to actually announce the engine change was something that the team would procrastinate on, out of fear of community backlash. However, regardless of this, the team would begin making the switch around August of 2014, many of the Rewind developers overjoyed at no longer having to use Crytek's CryEngine for development. Monetization was an element that Crytek had been interested in for Rewind, and their interest would be noticed by Hubica, who would jokingly suggest bikini skins for certain characters, although the idea of hats would soon override this joking comment. At the time, the team considered the Rewind project to be in competition with that Team Fortress 2, as it had been in the only other cartoony shooter on the market at that point in time. Hubica seemed incredibly interested in monetization, which put the Rewind team at odds with him. Well, I'm going to say this now, Hubica was a really nice guy, and honestly, I had a great time talking to him. He was a bit eccentric at times. He made some suggestions which were quite, which the team didn't really like. <laughs> I don't think I should really mention it. But he had, he, he said some funny things. Well, okay, we can take this out in editing afterwards. But I remember he said, hey guys, we should do a bikini skin. Yeah, we should do a bikini skin for Viola. You know? Yeah, and he said it exactly like that. No, he didn't. But he, he, he had suggestions which were kind of basically, he was taking into account monetization because one of the things that we were we were told to try and think of from Crytek was monetization for the project, which I had completely forgotten until I mentioned the whole bikini thing. Um, he the, the monetization for Cry for 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 Times was Rewind was going to be extra costumes or hats. Cubica thought hats would be a good route to take, a good route to take considering TF2. And at the time, TF2 was like our main competition. You know, TF2 was the only other cartoony shooter game around at the, at the time. And you know, since then we've had so many more. I mean. Oh my goodness, there have been so many kind of successful shooter games with a cartoony aesthetic. I mean, Overwatch, need I say more? But at the time, it was TF2, so we thought, well, how can we monetize this as a free-to-play thing? And so costumes, hats, etc., etc., were something which were brought up quite often by Hubica. However, people didn't like this. The team did not take well to the idea of monetization in the project, and the team was also at odds with some of his other plans. This reached a breaking point when Hubica took artwork the team had done and showed it off without permission from the artists who made them, angering the Rewind team. It's implied that the Steam Greenlight page was where this art was hosted, and the backlash he had gotten caused the Greenlight page to be shut down by Hubica himself. Out of embarrassment and upset the distress he had caused, Hubica left, reportedly around April 2015. To quote his own words when asked about this exit from the project, he said this, quote, Making some bad decisions that greatly upset the Rewind team. Instead of causing any further problems, I felt the best approach was to step away for a while. I originally joined the project as a community manager and had no experience leading a project, end quote. 2015 would continue on, with minimal progress being done. With Hubica gone, it had left its impact on the team, and things from here would only get more frustrating for the team. The team had used Skype as their platform for conversation about the game and spearhead and development. However, once Hubica left, and since he was the only person who was able to kick people out of this Skype group, a new group chat was made for active developers. Whilst unknown who it is exactly, one particular artist had issues with this, calling the move mean-spirited to those who had not being carried over from the original Skype group. The result was that this particular artist would lead the project, crippling the team more in the process, although not before bringing over those who had not been carried over from the original group. But the reason why he left is because he thought that us changing our the, the Skype group and not bringing people over was a bit mean to those other people. That some of those people who applied who weren't really active in terms of actually doing work, but may have been active in the conversation, we didn't bring them all over. And he thought that, you know, he thought it would be being very mean-spirited about it, and maybe we were, I'm not entirely sure. 
but he then kind of got quite angry at the person who led this, the other character artist who... Gee, this is getting, this is getting hard without saying people's names. Um, the other character artist. And so he brought over some of the team members who weren't actually actively working on the team and put them into the new group. And then he himself left. Because I think he just didn't want to deal with anything like that, which is, I guess, understandable if you read it that way. The progress that would be done would sadly be kept from the public for the most part. Work in the Unreal builds of the game and trailers designed to keep the public informed about the project would be planned but never released and in the documents that I was given by the anonymous source, it never states why this was the case. While the TimeSplitters Rewind site would continue to update the community in 2015 and 2016 with newly modelled weapons and characters, Plus some maps, the project, as described by Alfred Turner, one of the main Rewind developers, would describe the project at this time as being on death row. It was The project was basically like on death row at that point. People were just working on it for the sake of working on it. They liked working on it, but, you know, not much was happening. I was making characters, Damien was making levels, Steven was making levels, but in terms of a team effort, it wasn't any, it wasn't even close to what we had before, where there was daily progress and people were doing so much stuff, it was basically in shambles by that point. A new problem had arisen during the period of the project. Crytek themselves. Due to Hubica leaving, and because he was the only person in contact with Crytek UK who had maintained a stable relation, and connection, not to mention Crytek UK becoming Dan Buster Studios, the team would reach out to Crytek instead. Although little was gained from these interactions, most people in Crytek were unaware of the project's existence, or they were more concerned with the monetary we side of no it. We had no communication, or barely any communication. Every time we spoke to someone, it was like someone knew, and they had no idea what was going on with the project. They had no idea that this thing even existed. Some people thought, Oh, you guys have just went back to the crime engine. Some people thought, it's fine if you're on Real Engine, just as long as you make us money. And some people thought, will you make us money? And so it was just like, so no, Crytek didn't actually know this, what this project was about. Despite such issues, progress on Rewind would continue on as usual throughout the 2016-2017 era. It seems that during this time, although details are particularly hazy, the team had been working primarily on Real although they had kept the CryEngine build updated as development continued. Plans that they had according to particular documents showed that the team was considering collaboration with other companies, specifically Devolver Digital, as well as having some sort of E3 booth, with other documents also indicating that EA, Electronic Arts, who had published Times Brothers Future Perfect back in 2005, had had an interest in the project although it's unknown where these went. All these potential plans, however, as the public knows it, would never come to fruition. Updates here and there to the Rewind site and the Facebook page posted as usual, although a problem would arise during this time as Crytek, having formally been supportive of the team's use of Unreal for the game, would retract this view, forcing the team to work on CryEngine. Which, at that point, the team had come to somewhat loathe due to its difficulty in using. Irritation with CryEngine had reached a breaking point, as the Rewind Facebook page would post a small progress update on the game, telling people that development had gone stagnant and telling people that CryEngine was difficult to work with. Unfortunately, this post would spark an irritation in Crytek who, according to inside sources, told the Rewind team that they were doing irreparable damage caused to the Timesplitters brand Crytek and CryEngine. As a result, the team would attempt to apologise to Crytek, sending out a document to them and, 10 days after the Facebook post originally, they clarified their opinions to downplay the issues that had been going on behind the scenes. While it's unknown exactly if it's related, the Rewind team would talk to Crytek at some point in this year about signing a legal contract for the Rewind project. As mentioned before, Crytek had never officially written a legal contract for it, but when they were presented with a contract from the Rewind team, Crytek refused. And as one Rewind source indicates to me, it was probably so they could reserve the right to cancel it at any time. That has never, and currently is not, any contract explicitly allowing Rewind to exist." End quote. 
with such issues at hand and the team essentially being forced to deal with them by the hands of Crytek, development would continue onwards. With Rewind's history relatively documented now, let's crank the clock back to 2014 to a little known studio known as Dam Buster. With Rewind in 2014 being worked on, little did people know that other things had been happening. In 2014, Crytek as a whole had suffered some significant damage due to an internal financial crisis, and with not being able to pay the wages of the staff of the UK sector, Crytek UK would shut down. The subsidiary of Crytek that harboured the remains of Free Radical from six years ago would crumble, although not without an even faster comeback. Crytek as a whole would sell the rights to the Homefront franchise, a franchise they are known for, to Deep Silver, who, with the newly formed Dambuster Studios from the remains of Crytek UK, would continue to work on that on the latest entry into that franchise, Homefront The Revolution. Development of that game would continue as normal, although behind the scenes, something absolutely fascinating had been tinkered on. Please note, this information comes from an anonymous source, I can't verify the legitimacy, but it fits the timeline of events. Take it with a grain of salt. Upon the transfer to Dambuster Studios, one employee would begin tinkering with an unused version of Time Splitters 2 that had been experimented on during the days of Crytek. Internally, it had been a myth to the developers at Dambuster that a Time Splitters 2 arcade machine in Homefront existed. But it existed, and one of the key people behind getting into Homefront, the revolution like this, had left, leaving the assets in the hands of the anonymous source, who continued progress on it. Management had been fine with it, even putting it on the to-do list to get into Homefront, although due to the muddy situation between Deep Silver and Crytek with the rights of the Timesplitters IP, only two levels had been snagged from what they could have, Siberia and Chicago. It seemed that this build that Dan Buster had was the most complete version of the game out there. One that we haven't seen. From my conversations with the anonymous source, it seems that the build they had got contained a hidden fourth minigame that never appeared in any of the versions of Time Splitters 2 that we know about. For context, Time Splitters 2 contains three retro styled minigames, but according to the source, the Space Invaders has minigame had also been there originally, though removed due to being low quality. It's unknown if anything else had been included in whatever version build the anonymous source had. With a secret version of Time Splitters 2 in Homefront the Revolution as an easter egg, you can imagine the reaction that both the community and press had in 2016 upon the release of Homefront the Revolution. Articles upon articles telling people how to access the easter egg, YouTube videos, the reception had been largely positive, and with this in mind, the community would feel very reinvigorated. However, skip forward to 2018, August specifically, and the community would receive news that would shake them to the core. In early August of 2018, it had hit the gaming press in that the IPs of both Time Splits and Second Sight had been acquired by Coach Media, who is owned by THQ Nordic, a company known for taking old and abandoned franchises and essentially giving them a second chance by releasing HD ports, remakes, or sequels. The rights had been acquired from Crytek after all these years. With this news, the Time Splitters community would be overjoyed and fan hopes would be at the highest they would ever be. I remember accessing the r slash Time Splitters subreddit, as I'm one of the moderators there, on that day, and I have personally never seen more excitement from the community in my seven or so years of knowing it. Although details were primarily vague, it was enough to keep us going. We were very, very happy. 
In March of 2019, the Times Was Rewind project would release an update to the community on their YouTube channel, letting the community in on some of the problems the team had been facing and showing current progress, which looked good. The response from the community was primarily positive, although like in the past, the team would still need support and programmers, among other roles, to help smoothen out development. A few months later, in August 2019, Steve Ellis, one of the co-creators of the series and the man behind the engine the original games used, all the way back in Free Radical's time, would be hired by THQ Nordic to help plot out the future of the franchise. Community response to this has been exceptionally positive, akin to the prior year's announcement involving the series. While we don't know everything going on behind the scenes, what we can say for certain is this. There's a future for this series. We just have to wait and see for what it will be. I guess at this point the video will be more personal for me. In 2009 I began to play these games for the very first time. I started with Time Splitters 2. With having seen so much go on over the years, Rewind's rise into the press and development struggles, the fans praying for a new game, reinvigorating the subreddit, Time Splitters Online, etc. I'm very grateful to have made these three videos. I started this in November 2018, and with it being nearly one whole year since, I hope that these videos on the long and crazy, yet intriguing history of Time Splitters and Free Radical have been entertaining to you. Thank you, Time Splitters community, and thank you, my subscribers, for waiting so long for this. There's only one more thing to say. It's time to split.